All right, well, Netflix debuted Swamp Kings last week, and it has had some pretty mixed reviews, but we're going to dive into it tonight with a fairly familiar face, at least to me, Eric Wilbur. Eric was a punter on the 2006 National Championship team. He was Florida's starting punter from 2003 to 2006, and for the last 11 and a half years, he has been my husband. Eric, uh, you are joining me from our upstairs so that we're not awkwardly sitting next to each other in what is actually most of the time your office. So uh, thanks for uh, joining me. Of course. Happy to be here. Glad to get kicked out of my office for an interview. All right. So listen, I really want to talk about some of the things that were missing from Swamp Kings. You and I watched it together. Um, We had a really good time, you know, reminiscing about what was some incredible years, but there was some stuff in there that had this documentary been longer, it would have been really cool to to cover. Something that is kind of seared in my memory, so therefore I'm sure seared in yours, is Meyer's first team meeting. So can you walk me through it? (laughs) Uh, I can walk you through most of it, but I just happened to be late for that first team meeting. Um, I have a million excuses, most of it being I got a new cell phone, alarm didn't go off. Uh, So I walked in to the first team meeting late, basically. He ripped into me uh, saying, this is the kind of culture we're trying to change. You can't be late, all that kind of stuff. Um, But the biggest thing is, you know, we weren't happy. Uh, as the players, we weren't happy about what happened to Zook. Um, you know, looking back, we understand that, you know, you're there to win to win football games. But uh, the way that he was fired and the excuses that were made for it, uh, you know, didn't sit right with a lot of the players. And when Meyer came in, um, you know, that first meeting, he, he kind of squashed a lot of that. His biggest thing was, you know, I understand that you guys didn't choose me. I chose you and I chose you for a reason. He's like, I went through every player on this team. And I know what can happen. I know what we can do. So I understand that you're not going to want me, that you don't, you're not just going to jump in and like me, but I want you to know that I chose you for a reason. And that actually carried a lot of weight uh, coming in like that instead of coming in and just saying, basically, I own you now. I'm the coach. You have to do what I say. That came later, but at least in the first team meeting, uh, that that was the, the message. Um, Okay, so one of the things that was talked about a little bit on uh, the film was about Champions Club, Champions Dinner, and, you know, what what it took to get there. And you have a pretty interesting experience with the very first Champions Dinner, which would have happened summer A of the summer of 2005. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so Champions Dinner, basically, if you're doing everything right, uh, if you're showing up to practice, you're busting your butt, not getting into trouble, going to class, the per- people that are doing everything right, even if you're not the best player on the team, uh, he was really rewarding the effort and, and the hard work going into it. Uh, but the biggest thing is if you missed a practice for any reason, you didn't get champions there, right? So I actually had surgery, uh, I had a torn meniscus, so I had to have surgery um, going into that season and I missed like two weeks of practice. But I was still in the pit. I was still doing rehab, you know, four or five times a day when everything that I was supposed to do, but because I wasn't at practice and able to be on the field, I wasn't able to make it. So, uh, that, that did not make me very happy. Uh, basically, I mean, I, <laughs> I was real mad when I found out when I walked in expecting to go get my steak dinner and they escorted me over to get my hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, I basically just sat there. I was like, I'm not eating this, this, this isn't right. I don't deserve this. Uh, so I, I called, you know, someone uh, who's very close to me to go get me a steak dinner. And that would be you, Allie. So I do appreciate you going and grabbing that steak dinner for me because I was not eating those hot dogs. Um, I felt I deserved better. Uh, and I I mean, it, it's tough. You, you can't control injuries. So to punish someone because of that, even though they're still doing all the right things because of that injury, uh, that that just wasn't right in my mind. So... Well, two things. First of all, the way I remember it is more like you closing the bedroom door, being super pissed and me ordering Outback to try and like make it better. Um, But maybe we'll agree to disagree on that. But as a parent, okay, so 20 years later, as a parent, the message is kind of even when you do everything right, you control the things that you can control. Sometimes things go wrong. And I know you didn't like it in that moment at all. But in hindsight, it's kind of a valuable lesson. 
It is and it isn't. I mean, I I don't know. If looking back, if that happens to my kid, knowing that they're doing everything that they're supposed to, um, you know, it, it'd be one thing if I just wasn't showing up to to do rehab. Um, I, I mean, if you're injured, you're in the you're in the facility more than you are if you're not injured. Right. So the, the hours just get extended. So you're actually putting in a lot more time and a lot more work. You're just not able to be actually on the field. Um, so I, I get that aspect of it. I understand that, you know, injuries happen. And, you know, if you're in a championship and you're injured, and your team may not be able to win because of that. It is a punishment. But it it it's not uh, to me. It's not the same. I, I don't like that aspect of it. He, he revised the rules down the line. He did. He did that. revise the rules to where if you're injured and you're still doing everything right, um, you know, Coach Meyer was able to to make some changes for the better. Um, one of the things you kind of alluded to it a little bit in your answer to this question, but one of the things that we talked about as we were watching it was, you know, the, the quote, superstars get treated like superstars and my shit gets treated like shit. You pushed back a little bit about what he actually meant um, when saying things like that. Can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't if you're not a talented player. It's if you're willing to put in the effort, right? If you're putting in the effort, you're doing the work. I mean, he was all about it, at least for the time that I was there. I think there were some changes that happened after I left. I was still around the program a lot. Um, but the time that I was there, the people that were putting in the effort, even if you're not a superstar, it's going to be rewarded. It's going to be noticed. When he said the shit gets treated like shit, it's the people that are bad people, the people that are not willing to do what it takes to help the team, that are putting the team in a bad spot, that are going out, getting in trouble, stuff like that. That's what he meant by that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the lead into the 2006 season. Obviously, we saw how the 2005 season panned out, um, but I can remember sitting and watching Florida's first basketball national championship. So this would have been in April of 2006. And talk a little bit about the end of that game, what happened on University Avenue, and then what role that played in your championship run. I mean, I can't talk about everything that happened on University Avenue that, that night, but uh, <clears throat> my apartment, my, my townhome I stayed in was right on University. We, we put a couch and a TV outside. That game ended, and it was just a flood of people into the streets, and, and me and a bunch of teammates, I remember seeing Jarvis, David Nelson, all these guys, and we're looking at each other just saying, you know, this is what we want. This is what we're fighting for. And this was coming off the tail end of our first kind of real – off-season workout with Coach Meyer when we're really hitting mat drills and all that kind of stuff. So the brotherhood is is being built and, and the camaraderie and the strength behind it is being built and we see what we're capable of doing. Um, so that, that really just pushed us a lot. And that was one of the things with the documentary that kind of upset me is they didn't mention that basketball team at all. I mean, if they want to call us the Swamp Kings, we're kings because they were kings. They were kings because we were kings. I mean, it was just an unbelievable atmosphere to have all of those people, football, basketball, track, everyone all together, um, just pushing each other to that next level and competing for championships. Um, let's get into the 2006 season a little bit. Um, Florida loses to Auburn. There's a blocked punt. Um, obviously, you're the punter, so <laughs> it's it's your mistake. It's on you. Talk about being in the locker room and then what role you think that played in what eventually played out the rest of the season. So uh, I, I think that adversity pushed us to continue playing hard, knowing that there were no more mistakes for us throughout the season. Uh, you know, it, it was live or die every single game. Um, thanks for saying that that whole thing was my fault. I, I you know, remember it a different way. Um, Share with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when we lined up, um, I, I believe it was it was a, a left punt. And if they overload that side, we're supposed to check down and we're supposed to motion some people in to get some extra blockers on that side. Well, we weren't making the motion, and I saw my up back was about to make the cadence for the snap. So I was yelling at him, hey, check, 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 check. And then the snap comes. It wasn't a perfect snap. It was you know low to the right. I'm supposed to be punting left. They were overloaded on that side and coming in. And you can see on the release of the guys that as soon as they release, they're veering left, right? 
So it, it, it's definitely going that direction. It should have been audibled out. Typically, we would audible maybe into one of those rugby punts that Meyer loves so much. Um, but there are a lot of things that happened uh, during that sequence of events. Uh, obviously, I drop the snap. I roll it. I try and kick it left footed. Uh, but those guys were just on top of me. So, I, I mean, I do take responsibility for the play. Uh, I also take responsibility that I think that play in that game kept us fighting for the championship. Um, I, I feel like if we didn't have that adversity and we slipped later in the season, we wouldn't have been able to fight back and become number two to, to be able to get to the championship game. And I remember vividly, uh, it, it was the next, I want to say the next season, or the next off season, I was walking through the weight room and Myers walking past me and he's got, you know, some people with him and he stops me. He's like, Hey, Wilbur. I'm like, yeah, coach, what's up? He's like, Hey, I bet you wish you could get that punt back at Auburn. Don't you? I looked him straight in the face. I was like, nah, coach, I'm good. We won the championship because of it. I just kept on walking. So I, I have no problems with how that turned out. Um, I, I think it, it kept us driving for that championship. Okay, so let's move forward to the SEC championship game. We both had a little bit of an issue with how this game was <laughs> portrayed uh, because the sequence of events wasn't actually accurate to the way that it played out. And obviously, you know, this film as a whole was incredible. It was amazing to look back and see. But, you know, the little tiny plays that you're involved with when they get out of order is a little annoying. <laughs> but talk to us about the SEC, um, the SEC game. Talk about the fake punt and then the actual punt that led to kind of a momentum change. Yeah. So, you know, going into the SEC championship, we knew that there were a lot of things that had to happen. Um, you know, we came out, we, we played great uh, the first half, and then all of a sudden we come out pretty flat the second half. I do remember that just the buzz around the stadium uh, as soon as USC lost. And, you know, we always go out, the kickers and punters go out early from halftime to get warmed back up. And, I mean, that was it. We were just saying, hey, we got a shot. We got a shot. We can do this. Uh, so we were very excited for that. And then just to come out flat and, and Arkansas is just giving it to us basically the, the whole third quarter. Um, then we get the ball. We're deep in our end zone. Obviously, our drive stalls, uh, you know, we're on our 15-ish yard line. And I remember, coach, you know, in the documentary, uh, coach is sitting there saying, you know, I, I had it written on my folder, you know, let the MF go. And I remember that I, I didn't read his folder or anything, but I remember I was in his ear because he was debating it. And I was just like, coach, you got to grow a pair. Like, we got to do this. Let's grow a pair and do this. And he's just kind of shaking his head. And he's like, all right, let's do it. So, uh, I mean, Jamel Cornelius, one of the fastest guys on the field. There was no doubt as soon as he got that ball that it was just going to be gone. And Meyer's schematics on, on special teams, like he had this drawn up for this specific instance for, I don't even know how long, but it, it was a guarantee that that play was going to work. Um, but what they said in the documentary was that we used our last time out right before that, uh, that fake punt. And that's not what happened. I think we actually used three timeouts on that drive. Um, so we get the first down, Jamel runs for the first down, and then we basically go three and out again. And it's, you know, fourth and short. Um, I don't even know what yard line I want to say, maybe the, our, our own 45 ish yard line. And Coach Meyer then burns our last time out. So, you know, I was getting ready to go punt. He uses our last time out. And I go take my chin strap off and take my helmet off. I'm like, all right, we're not punting. We just burn our last time out. There's zero chance we're punting. And then he calls punt team up. And, you know, my exact words out of my mouth were, there's no way we just called our last time out to go punt the effing ball. And he just looks at me. I'm just like, I mean, that was a terrible coaching decision, right? If if it didn't end up the way it ended up, that was a terrible coaching decision. So I go out, uh, I hit the punt of my life, and you know, mistake by the returner. He tries to go catch it over his shoulder at like the two yard line. He bobbles it. Wandy jumps on the ball and just, I mean, that place goes crazy. We get a touchdown and then just never look back from there. So uh, that that play, I think, was the biggest play of that game. Um, because with the timeout called, with a punt that we he doesn't drop, that we don't score a touchdown on, I don't know if we win that game. A little known story about Wandy Pierre Louis, who recovered that is he's from Haiti, and the one game of his entire career that his mom got to come over from Haiti to watch was that one. So she uh, got to see him be a part of a major momentum change for the SEC championship game, which I think is so super special. Okay, so y'all win that game. You beat Auburn. 
talk about the month leading up to the national championship. Meyer really used his psychology degree to get you guys ready for this. Oh, he did. But there was so much billboard material from all the talking heads out there, Kirk Herbstreet, all the guys, we don't belong there, you know, Ohio State, you know, undefeated, just untouchable. Troy Smith won the Heisman, all that kind of stuff. So we were the type of team that we got motivated by the challenge. People say we're not good enough. We're going to say we're about to prove you wrong. Like we we weren't a guy of a bunch of prima donnas like, yeah, we had talent, but we still had those workhorses that are like, we're going to prove to you why we belong here. And we'd be watching film. And it was so funny because I remember, uh, and this actually happened in the game too. We'd be watching film. There'd be, you know, James Laurinaitis. And he'd be looking at him. He's like, our walk-on fullback is going to destroy this guy. He's like, I don't know who he thinks he is, but our walk-on fullback, Billy Latsko, is going to destroy this guy. And that's what happened. Laurinaitis was basically in tears that whole game. Uh, just Billy blew him up. But it was, all he said was, they can say whatever they want. If you look at the film, you tell me which one of those players is better than ours. Right? We can go four deep and we're still matching their ones. All they had was their ones and that was it. And that's what happened. So the, the motivation was there. Um, Meyer just kept putting it in front of us. He'd have it plastered all over the place. What all the you know ESPN announcers, everyone was saying that, you know, we don't belong there. We don't deserve to be there. It should have been a, a replay of US, of Ohio State, Michigan. Um, and, you know, we came out for blood. All right. Last untold story, or unless you have more. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Um, one, but. Okay. <laughs> Tell everybody the Derek Harvey workout story. Oh. One of my favorites. Okay. So uh, Meyer's philosophy was if someone's not doing what they're supposed to, punch them in the face. And not figuratively punch them in the face. Literally just get up and punch them in the face. Right? <laughs> and it got to the point that there were, you know, fists being thrown left and right all over the place. But uh, I specific specifically remember this one off-season workout that uh, we had teams competed against each other. So we were divided up into like four or six different teams and we'd run through all these different speed drills and it was, you win or lose, everything was a competition. And if your team had more points, your team won. If your team didn't have more points, your team lost. And then you had to do extra sprints at the end. So this time my team lost, coach Mullen was the coach of that group of people. Derek Harvey's on my team. So we got to go run, I don't know, some like 30, 20 yard sprints down and back. Uh, we got Mickey Marotti sitting over there blowing the whistle. And all of a sudden after like six sprints, he's like, those don't count. Go back, do it again. We're just like, what's going on? And I mean, you can't really argue. It's like, all right, go back. Let's start over and do it again. All of a sudden that one doesn't count. Go back, do it again. It's, he kept saying your hand behind the line, your hand behind the line. And then finally you look around and you start seeing all these guys hands on the line, not behind the line. And it's the little details, right? The little details that matter, the inches that matter. So after like the third or fourth time of this happening, Derek Harvey is on my right. Coach Mullins on my left. We get down, we get lined up. Marathi's saying, hand behind the line, get down. So we get down and Harvey puts his hand on the line. And I just lean over, give him a little tap. I'm like, dude, D Harv, get your hand behind the line, man. And he just looks at me like I'm stupid, right? Cause I'm just the punter, right? What, what am I going to do? So I decide to help the team out. So I move his hand for him behind the line. Uh, he didn't like it very much. So he pops up and we both come up just swinging. Right. And, you know, I'm 6'2", 210. He's not. He's much bigger than that. Um, so we're just going at it. And luckily, right. I, of course, I had the reputation of just being the crazy punter. Luckily, Coach Mullen was right there and witnessed that entire sequence of events because everyone's looking at me like you're just an idiot for doing this. And he jumped in. He's like, no, Wilbur was trying to make sure we don't keep running. So, uh, I mean, me and D Harv made up. So we, we figured it all out. But, yeah, I was, uh, I was willing to take some hits for the team on that one. All right. Well, are there any other stories you want to share with me before we run? <laughs> uh, that I want to share. Um, that you can a, share a lot of, the statute of limitations. I think a, a lot of missed things in the documentary that they could have focused on. Uh, you know, they, they didn't put... I think a big emphasis on the true transition of Zook to Meyer. Um, they didn't put a big transition on Meyer from when he got there to when he left or even the 08, 09 season. 
I think he changed on how he was treating the players and the philosophy behind what he was doing. Um, you know, I, I think there was a lot there. Uh, again, the basketball team, the culture in Gainesville, what was going on there. Um, I mean, Jarvis Moss, uh, uh, you know, the story behind, you know, what happened leading up to him blocking that kick, getting suspended the week before coming out and just knowing that he was going to have the game of his life during that time. Um, you know, th there were a lot of things there that were missed. Uh, another thing, uh, I forgot who it was, was it Spike said that, you know, Tebow didn't go out. Well, I don't remember that. So I was there when Tebow was a freshman and I remember him being out with us. Now he wasn't doing stupid stuff. He wasn't out drinking or anything, but he was with the team. He was a part of the team. And I think that was the biggest difference that I saw between Chris Leak and Tim Tebow is Chris was a great player, right? He was in the books. He knew the plays, phenomenal quarterback, but he wasn't hanging with the team. You didn't really get to know him. Tim, from the second he came in, he was going out with us. He was in the clubs with us. Again, not doing anything stupid, but he was with us. He was building that, that brotherhood and that camaraderie uh, with the players from the get-go. So I think that may have changed once the limelight really shifted to be a just Tebow limelight. Um, but when he got there, he was out with us all the time. All right. Well, it was definitely a fun walk down memory lane. Um, I know we both enjoyed it. Some of the, some of the best years for sure. Thank you very much for hanging out and, uh, we're going to have to do it again sometime. Absolutely. I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs>